I'm waiting for an intelligible message from space, and here is one. Is it intelligible? Yes. You can decipher it. Oh, for heaven's sake. Look, do you think the cosmos inhabited by a load of Boy Scouts sending Morse code? Look, what is this, Dennis? Is it a message? Have a look. Let me see. Could be from a distant probe. Or another planet. Yes. I remember talking to a very learned friend, Sir Edward Bullard, a famous geophysicist, and I said, look, we're getting this very strange signal. It seems to have fixed coordinates in, in the sky, but it's a series of, of regular pulses. And, uh, of course, the question mark was in our minds, too. You know, could it be intelligence or something? And he said, well, simplest explanation. He said, look, could see if it's a single frequency. And then it's probably 99% an intelligent signal. You know, uh, radio signals naturally emitted cover a whole broad range of, of radio frequencies, but uh, it's, it's, it's intelligent things that, that radiate on a single, single frequency, and that's what it turned out to be. And the intelligent signal became more real, actually. So things were all getting rather tense at that stage. I went down to Tony's office late one evening to ask him about something, and rather unusually, the door was shut. Tony normally had an open door policy. So I knocked, and a voice said, come in, and I poked my head round the door, and Tony said, ah, Jocelyn, come in, and shut the door. And there was a high-level meeting going on in there. There was Tony, there was Martin Ryle, the professor, the head of the group, and one other senior person. And it was a discussion that I think I should have been in on, actually, from the beginning. We thought this was bigger than we want to handle ourselves. We don't just give it to the press. This has to be done properly. And uh, I discussed this with Martin Ra because I was wondering what to do. And um, he was half joking, but uh, he said, burn the records and forget about it. Because he said, if uh, the news gets out that there's intelligence out there, what is going to happen? People will want to launch a signal in that direction to talk to them or something. And he said, supposing all they're doing on that uh, distant planet is looking for a reply somewhere so that they can, they're overcrowded, they're looking for a nice young green planet somewhere that they can, they can, they can occupy. That's what it's all about. And, and the next thing that's happened, you'll be invaded. We didn't solve it that evening. And I went home to get some supper and I was really getting pretty cross. Uh, my money was running out. I wanted to get a thesis done, get my PhD. And there was some silly lot of little green men choosing my radio telescope and my frequency to signal to Earth. You know, how dare they, kind of thing. Got some supper and felt I had to come back to work. With all these special observations on the pulsars, the twinkling quasars had been rather neglected. And there was a huge backlog of these survey charts to be analysed. And at about quarter to ten at night, I was analysing chart from another piece of sky and thought I saw a piece of this scruffy kind of signal. Looked exactly like what I was seeing before but from a totally different bit of the sky. Right. I thought I'm not going to bed tonight, I'm going out to the observatory. That bit of the sky, due to go through the telescope beam at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, December the 21st, perishing cold. And I switched on the high speed recorder and it came blip, 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 blip. Clearly the same family, the same sort of stuff. And that was great. That was really sweet. It finally scotched the little green men hypothesis because it's highly unlikely there's two lots of little green men opposite sides of the universe, both deciding to signal to a rather inconspicuous planet Earth at the same time 
using a daft technique and a, a rather commonplace frequency. It has to be some new kind of star, not seen before. And that then cleared the way for us publishing, going public. Martin Ryle called up the editor of Nature, John Maddox, and, and more or less said, we've got something interesting coming. Um, he didn't quite say hold the presses, but he nearly did. Now, the people here say that if they got three signals as exactly spaced as that, it would be very unusual. If they got four, it would be phenomenal. Well, they've had pulses as exactly spaced as that 24 hours of the day since November. Well, these signals that we're picking up are entirely new. Nothing like this has been seen in radio astronomy before. The excitement was because this was a totally unexpected, totally new kind of object, behaving in a way that astronomers had never expected, never dreamt of. Here is a discovery which illustrates the universe is far more complex than we at present believe. That month, that, that was a, a real high point. And uh, when I wrote that nature letter, I thought, you know, my God, that's pretty good, actually. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Yeah. Seeing the article in print was tremendous. And I remember sending a copy of the paper to my physics teacher. And that's your physics teacher at the Mount? At the Mount, yes. My physics teacher at the Mount. And how did he react to it? He had actually alerted the school. There was a lot of publicity. Mr Tillett had seen this and told the school. There aren't so many people that take up physics as a profession and certainly relatively few women of my generation. So Mr Tillett followed with some interest my career and I was really pleased that he was still around at the time of the discovery. The family was just amazed, absolutely. I'm proud. Very proud. Despite the obvious importance of Jocelyn Bell's discovery, the mysterious bursts of energy still hadn't been named. We hadn't really thought of a name for these things. So this journalist, who was from the Daily Telegraph, said, uh, what about Pulsar as an abbreviation for pulsating radio star? And he wrote it up on the board in the office where we were meeting. And we looked at it and thought, oh, yeah, that looks OK. If only a very few pulsars have been discovered so far, and they're all very close to the sun, comparatively speaking, doesn't this mean that there must be vast numbers of them scattered throughout the galaxy? Oh, yes. If they're distributed throughout the galaxy in the way we find them uh, close to the sun, then there must be millions of them in our own galaxy. And, of course, the most important question of all, what are they? Well, we know that they're very small. They're objects about the size of a planet. We know also that they're very energetic and that the source of energy must be far greater than a planet could really provide. It must be something like a star compressed into a volume the size of a planet. To work out what pulsars are, we had to go back to exploding stars, the supernovae. It used to be assumed that a supernova was total catastrophic destruction of the star, with everything dispersing out into space. However, in the 1930s, an astronomer, a Swiss astronomer called Zwicky, a guy who had a lot of ideas, a very creative mind, he reckoned that when these supernovae occurred, the core of the star got shrunk right down to make this very dense ball, and it would be rich in neutrons, so it was called a neutron star. Neutron stars were a pretty wild idea. Nobody took them very seriously, and I don't know that people took Zwicky very seriously either. 
but we now know, following the discovery of pulsars, that there are these objects left behind. Because it turns out that the pulsars are indeed neutron stars, and Zwicky was right. This is what we believe the neutron star will look like. The neutron star is an incredibly compact thing. These lines show you the direction of the magnetic field close to the neutron star. They've got a very strong magnetic field, perhaps a million, million times the Earth's magnetic field. And it seems that coming from the magnetic north and south poles, there's a beam of radio waves. And as the star spins, this beam gets swept round the sky, like a lighthouse beam. And each time a beam sweeps across the Earth, we see a pulse. So if you get a pulsar going four times a second, it means it's spinning four times a second. If you get a pulsar going 600 times a second, it's spinning 600 times a second, which beggars imagination, but that's what seems to be the case. The faint blips from space, so nearly dismissed as error, took the world by storm, and any astronomer worth his salt wanted a piece of the action. Observing pulsars is like listening to a Beethoven symphony. There is the rhythm of the pulses themselves, and within the pulses, a complicated pattern of notes, sometimes at one frequency, sometimes at another, just as in the melody of a musical composition. All of a sudden, people went from uh, thinking about stars as being sort of un unchanging, the universe being relatively dull and boring, to suddenly the universe is full of these things flickering and flashing around, extremely energetic, very exciting. Pulsars are a very important discovery, but they were an enabling discovery because it actually showed that not only did these ideas exist theoretically, but they could actually be seen. And it allowed us to tie down many of the other theoretical ideas that were in vogue at the time. Stephen Hawking got on to me and said how delighted he was, congratulations and so on. And he said, well, if neutron stars exist, you must believe strongly in black holes. I mean, a neutron star is so close to being a black hole that if neutron stars are there, then there's no question that black holes are there too. It's all to do with the mass of the star that's collapsing. If the star is about the size of the sun, it's going to form a white dwarf where it's held up by the pressure of the material inside it. If the star is more dense, it actually will form a neutron star where the, the, the neutrons themselves actually are the thing that's providing the basic pressure. If there's even more mass, the neutrons themselves aren't strong enough to hold up against the force of gravity, the star collapses further and you get a black hole. I mean, black holes were a bit of a joke in those days. You know, Stephen Hawking was making these outrageous suggestions and so on, and people didn't take black holes at all seriously. Uh, but I think after that, they did. Like many scientific discoveries, it took an open-minded researcher to realize there was something there to be discovered. It was a quality which had been instilled in Jocelyn Bell Burnell from an early age. I was born into a Quaker family. Um, my son who's done the research tells me I am ninth generation Quaker. Uh, I've been active in Quakers all my life and still am. <laughs> 